there's an expression people they play devil's advocate. Devil's advocate. Torah Chaim, he plays the positive inclinations advocate. That the devil, the evil inclinations always whispering in the ears to discourage us to see it differently and to undermine the impetus to do the right thing. We're speaking about doing chesed, lending money, creating something unusual which has great value. And he says, I understand you should do good. But you realize that people who are much wealthier than you are, who are much smarter than you are, and they don't get involved in this kind of thing. So why you're a simple guy, you don't have that much money. Why should you be the one to take the lion's share of this where people outpace you endlessly in understanding and they don't? And they could do with almost effortlessly, they could do what they're asking of you to do. And for you, it's a sacrifice. It's a burden. It's an infringement to a degree. You know, he says, you know, that really makes good sense. And these are observant people. We're not to be a people who don't believe or don't uphold the Torah. They uphold the Torah. So Chavetz Chaim says, he responds, if you have a business opportunity and it's presented to wealthy people and they pass on it, is it we're not interested right now? And the one who's the expert who has a track record that anybody who's advised has seen multiple returns on the investment. They say, well, and you understand that the person who's advised you to put your money there, even significant amount of money, even if you have to borrow money, he has credibility. He's never failed the client. But the, the wealthy people, they pass on it. The meet said was the wealthy people pass on the opportunity for whatever reason. Do you pass on the opportunity? If it's being endorsed by the expert of experts, the answer is, of course not. But yet we have this opportunity, which is being endorsed by Hashem and by the wisest man who ever lived to do chesed, and the return is eternity. Multiple times a bracha, not only for yourself, but for all your generations till the end of time are going to be beneficiaries of this investment. How do you... How, how, how do you pass on it? It's foolish to say, well, other people all don't value it, you shouldn't value it. Other people have no interest, you should have no interest. Not only should you have an interest, Shlomel says you should pursue it. You should pursue it as if nothing matters but that. That's how important it is. Hashem says to Avram, before he informed that he was going to destroy Sodom and Amorah, Am I going to not share this with Avram, who teaches his children the tradition of justice and chesed? How could I withhold it from him? So God himself says, Avram has that unquantifiable value because he's trans transmitting to his children justice and act doing acts of loving kindness. So if Hashem is saying that, how can we say, pass on it, because whoever says it's not that important. If God himself says, Avram's whole value is only because of that. So he explains it this way. You know, we all know nobody has, have a, has a perfect record. And after 120 years, if you believe in the afterlife, and you believe what we read in Pirkei Ovos, that this world is only a corridor to arrive in that banquet hall, it's only in the introductory setting for ultimately to 
achieve what you must have to be able to go there, which is eternity, but it's not so simple to arrive this, because nobody's perfect. Nobody has a perfect record. And very often, to be able to achieve that level of perfection, you have to undergo some level of purging. But if you have chesed, chesed protects you from that level of prosecution that you don't need that purging. I'll give you an example. A person has to hire an attorney, a criminal lawyer, to defend you that you should not be found guilty. And it costs a fortune. And when your children find out the amount of money that it's going to cost you to cover those legal fees, they'll say, you know, father, if you spend that kind of money, there's not going to be anything left in the inheritance. So the father says, but what happens if I don't have this expert legal team? I can be put away forever. I could be tortured to death. But they said, we understand, Father. But what about us? We're going to be left bereft without you, without money. At least we'll have something left. You will send, we'll send you down the road, that off the cliff, but at least we'll have. So the Chavetz Chaim says, that's in, 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 that's in reality what's, what, 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 what a person thinks. My children want, I should be put on the chopping block. I should be put, go to the guillotine. So I should leave them my estate so they should be able to live well or whatever it is. But if a person understands the value of chesed, the protective barriers that it creates, that he's not going to be subject to that level of prosecution, and that's going to sway the balance to innocent versus guilty, how does a person even take into account, but if I give charity, which is chesed, What's going to be left for my children? We're not saying you should leave your children bereft, but you have to have a significant portfolio of chesed that worst scenario, you have something to protect you, and that will protect you. And that's Chofetz Chaim. So with all the whisperings, and it has nothing to do with why don't the wealthy people do it. It has nothing to do with this. You have a person who has a medical condition, and he needs a certain medication. You say, what about the others? Why don't they take their medication? You know, I'm not aware of what that other person's health record is. But I know for myself, nobody's perfect. So I have to take that, bolster my health and protect my health with whatever I need to guarantee that I make it through. You make it through the, the, the firing line. You know, in Europe, there were sometimes people were, were condemned to run the gauntlet. What was the gauntlet? The gauntlet was that a person, they would have soldiers who had batons. And when you had to run the gauntlet, you had to run in between them. And as you ran, they would beat you. And if you made it out to the other side, you may have been injured, bruised, you were alive. But sometimes they could hit you on your head and cause you brain injury and kill you on the spot. Everybody's running the gauntlet. The question is, are you able to bypass the swipes and the strikes of those who, who, who are standing as you're running that gauntlet? What gives you that ability to run the gauntlet, to come out at the other end, unscathed, unbruised? Chesed is what does it. And all of us have to run the gauntlet. You never know to what degree. And what are the chances? No, we don't want to take the chance. We want to make it through with the least amount of injury. This is what Chesed does. But he says it's not enough to do Chesed. King Solomon says you have to be rodev Chesed. You have to pursue it. It's a pursuit of life. You pursue it, that means your persona is, I want to help others. I want to do good to others. Not the name of Goodis. Your name is Goodis. It's not Goodis, it's not enough. You got you to gotta continue to be involved. That's just a pun. Right? You gotta, you got it's not run goodness. Run goodness. It's do goodness. You understand? That's what you have to do. You know, in Russia, before the Russian Revolution, 
the last czar who was who was killed, him and his family, they were murdered by the Bolsheviks when they overthrew the, the czar and the czarina and their children. They this czar, his name was Nikolai II. He's a rabid anti-Semite. He hated Jews to their core. And he instituted the 25-year draft. They figured they couldn't Christianize the Jews by force, but the way to do it is to take the children when they're young, 8, 10 years old, take them away from the parents, send them off to a convent, and expose them to a Christian, non-Jewish environment. Within a short period of time, they're Christianized. The parents... As much as we torture them and threaten them, it's not enough. We'll, we'll steal the children. And that's what they did. So every community had to give so many children for this conscription into this orientation to become Russianized or Russified, whatever you want to call it. And every community, and who did they hire? to take the children, so everybody would hide their children because they were afraid that their children would be actually stolen from them and conscripted into this type of setting. So they, the government understood this. So they hired Jews, Jews. They would pull up by a elementary school with a paddy wagon and he would go in and he was called a snatcher. The Jew was the snatcher. He go into a class with eight, ten-year-old children, and he would go in, and he would take five children out of the class. As much as the child would kick and scream, he'd grab him by his collar, pull him out, take him outside, throw him into this paddy wagon, and they'd go off with ten children, and they go from community to community, and they gathered thousands of children. They, they he snatched them, and the snatcher. In Yiddish, it was called the Chaper, Chaper. And he would do this. And if the teacher would in any way interfere, the soldiers downstairs would be called up and they would shoot the teacher on the spot. They would kill the teacher. So no teacher would interfere whatsoever when the snatcher would come and grab their children. In Brisk, which was the community of Chaim Brisker, of Chaim Salvechik, right before the Re Russian Revolution, the children of the best families were leaving the fold. Communism, socialism, anarchism, every ism. And there was no family that was left unscathed. Many of the children, they abandoned the Judaism. But there was one family in Brisk, despite all these very strong negative influences, they remained committed to the, to the religion. And it was like amazing. It was almost miraculous. There was the family that was not affected. And this one family was unaffected. So they went to Reb Chaim Brisker and they asked, what, this person here, what special merit did they have that their children should remain totally intact, committed to the tradition, and all these external influences did not affect the family? So Reb Chaim says, I can tell you a story that this person, his father was a teacher in an elementary school. And what they call a malamit. A malamit. And one of the snatches came into the school and came into his class, third grade class. The boys were 10 years old, nine years old. And this snatcher who was a Jew, grabs the kid, one of the children by the collar, starts pulling him out of the class, and he's kicking and screaming. And the teacher, what we call the Rebbe, goes over to the snatcher, slaps him across the face with such force, he drops the child and runs out. What happened? Well, this snatcher, if he would have gone downstairs and reported him to the, the soldiers, they would have come up immediately and killed the teacher. The man was so shocked that he was hit to such a degree, he left the class and ran out, did not come back. And the child, the children of the class were saved. 
So Reb Chaim said, Reb Chaim Briska, Reb Chaim Slavich said, in the merit of that patch, patch is a wallop. In the merit of that slap, that's why this person's children are protected. When he slapped that person, he took his life in his own hands. His life was at risk. Because if that person would have informed, reported on him, he, his life was worthless. They would have killed him on the spot. But because he would put himself out, not to allow it to happen, that this child should remain committed to the tradition, God says, you put your life on the line to protect the child, to remain committed to the tradition, regardless of the influences, your children remain committed to the tradition. That's what Chaim Briska said. Therefore, they were impervious to all the influences, the external influences. When you do chesed, it's not only your account. You have a positive account. God says, if you do for others, God says, I do for you. What's the greatest chesed? The greatest chesed a person can have. What's the greatest success in a person's life? A person earns a billion dollars, a trillion dollars. I don't think anybody in the history of this world has ever earned a trillion dollars. Even the, the Sultan Bernay, Bernay, even all these people never going to achieve that. But what a, a Jew is able to achieve in his life, if you, which cannot be quantified, eternity, a share of the world to come, all existence encapsulated into one moment is not even a whiff of what the world to come is. When you do chesed, you do for others, God says, you know what the payback is. It's not only eternity for you, it's eternity for your children, your grandchildren at the end of time. God says, I will look out for your family because of what you did. Knowing that, I'm not saying that should be the reason why you should do it. But factually, if push comes to shove, which basket are you putting your eggs? You want your eggs to be in that basket. Guaranteed return. And who's the guarantor? God himself is the guarantor. But how do you know that's what God wants? Because King Solomon, the wisest of all men who ever lived, walked the face of this earth. They said, that's the best investment. So God says it's the best investment. King Solomon seconds, seconds that choice, confirms it. As I said, chesed is not only financial outlay, a word of encouragement, advice. Small amounts of money can make worlds of a difference. That's what it's all about. But where does it begin? You know, there's a mitzvah called Avas, Avas Yisrael. There's a positive command, commandment, Vavta Lurecha Kamocha. You should love your, love your fellow as you love yourself. Positive commandment. Once you have that, and you see your fellow no different than yourself, all these impediments, all, all these levels of discouragement, all the reasons why you should not do, immediately removed. If I'm concerned for you as I'm concerned for myself, if I'm concerned for myself, what I'd be worried about, I'll, I'm not going to have something for my retirement. It doesn't come into play. Or if you want to do something for your son, are you, are you concerned? It's your child. So the Torah says you have to be concerned for a fellow Jew as you free yourself. So if that's the case, the moment you have that perspective that the other person is special, all the reasons why not immediately fall away, unless you, actually you can't. If legitimate you can't, you can't. Which we have, well, you could. A small amount, a larger amount, not even financial outlay. Give him some time. He wants to come to speak to you. He needs... He needs advice. He needs counsel. Too busy. Would you be too busy for your own child? Would be would you be too busy for the person you want to be busy with? So why picking and choosing? The answer is because it's lacking in what we call avasi sorrow. You must love your fellows, you love yourself. That's what it is. Once you have that in place, it's a lot easier to do chesed. Because I don't know what a man from Adam. But he's come with a guarantor, he's come with collateral, he's come with everything. Why not? But you never know where that could lead.
Maybe he's coming to somehow to mislead me. He wants to ingratiate himself to, with me. You never know. But all these whisperings are whisperings of the evil inclination. And if you see that person and you give him the benefit of the doubt and you put a seam in a positive light, all these levels of discouragement immediately fall, fall away. 